like caterpillars blossoming into beautiful butterflies or seeds blooming were planted, like the gestational experience of babe leaping in the womb of a woman or mere clay being shaped into stunning sculptures. If the truth be told and the truth should be told, the process of becoming happens in small, large, quiet, noisy, peaceful, chaotic, secret, and public places, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, in shadows, mimicking illusions, we discover the purpose Ah, oh, in the pain from the tears that water invisible seeds of strength wrapped in courage and kissed by the lips of wisdom like travailing women glued to horns of altars. We, we become as we walk in the beauty of forgiveness. We conquer fears by discovering the freedom and vulnerability as we heal from past hurts and past pains and past disappointments. We embrace the truth of our identity, we know, wait, I, I realized that it didn't kill me, it strengthened my core, it cultivated my character, it increased the volume of my voice, it produced my stage, and it gave my story beautiful eagle wings, and with my face set like a flint, it gave me courage to leap into the direction of my destiny. That's why where I was born, lived, grew, and age could no longer determine my health or my wealth. My father's incarceration was not my destination because those social determinants of life had to contend with the village of mentors that refused to let me fail. And this gift, the very expression and application of my creative imagination, took the limits off my potential. So now I overcome them by the words of my testimony, by the resilience in my my spirit and by the strength that allows my heart to take the center stage, I am no longer just a number in their statistics. I am not the problem. I am the core of the solution. I am a voice to be reckoned with, and I have the right to write myself free, but that freedom don't end with me. I am a scribe for the whole community. So if my voice were to leave me now, please find my pen and don't forget my paper. True story, I was in my early 20s and I was sitting on my grandmother's bathroom floor writing what I thought was a suicide letter that I was leaving to my family and friends only to realize the sections of the letter rhymed and that I had the ability to write poetry. <laughs> and that's when the poet came alive in me. They tell me that film develop in dark places. Well, I'm 100% convinced that people do too. And everything happens in a place. So much so that when my family needed to go to the bathroom, they would knock on the door and say, we gotta go. And I would say, go to the other bathroom. And they would be like, Tamikia, we ain't got no other bathroom. <laughs> I realized two things that night. I was a poet and we only had one bathroom. <laughs> but when I tell that story, I can't help but to think about the statistics about how 800 plus thousand people die via suicide worldwide, how it's the 10th leading cause of death for adults and the second leading cause of death for young people ages 10 through 24. And I can't help but to ask myself, how did I not become a part of that number? And I want to assert that this was the reason why. It was the arts that became my voice. It was the mentors that became my influence. And it was the academia that became my resources later on in life. I want to talk about the arts for a minute. I had the opportunity of going to a performing arts high school, and the arts were consistently in my face. And then I had the opportunity of doing community service events, and I was able to participate in different things in great stages that way. But also in church where they would just stir up the gift. Uh huh. I was in everybody's Easter play, everybody's Christmas play, and I always had the opportunity to be in front of people doing what I loved and was passionate about. I was also kept because of the mentors. My high school teacher, my sixth, seventh, and eighth grade high school teacher was a wonderful mentor. She was the reason why I got into the performing arts high school. She stayed with me, and unfortunately, she was killed via domestic violence. And then the world of academia. Later on in life, I understood and appreciated this. When I started to realize the researchers that were connected to things like health equity and, and uh, behavior health, I began to realize that we need the world of academia to support why we take the platforms and we're activists about things. We need the world of academia to support us in those ventures. Metaphorically speaking, to me, the process is like uh, a puzzle. 
You know, it has so many scattered pieces all over the place, and it's our job to put those pieces together. But the bigger question becomes, how do you trust the process of becoming when the pieces are so scattered, when they're all over the place? How do you trust this process? I want to talk about three pieces of my puzzle that was just all over the place, and I had to bring them together because, ironically enough, they all work together in one way or another. The first one was forgiveness. Now, forgiveness is more than saying sorry, because in most cases, you won't get an apology, but you'll still be faced with the opportunity. And I call it opportunity not lightly, but it's an opportunity to forgive people. Forgiveness sometimes comes in the form of reconciliation, where you say, listen, it happened. I trust you won't do that again. I'm going to reconcile myself back to you. But forgiveness also comes in the form of separation, where you say, look, it happened, and I trust you're going to do it again. So I'm not coming back. <laughs> Either way, it's forgiveness, right? <laughs> but forgiveness is essential because forgiveness is your peace, and not just your peace in life, not just your P-I-E-C-E, -E, but it is your P-E-A-C-E, -E, your peace. And so I've come to the place where I'm not going to allow anybody or anything to happen in my life to steal my P-E-A-C-E, because -E, I want my P-I-E-C-E. -E. <laughs> Boom. Identity. <laughs> I lost her. I lost her because when I first came to poetry, especially, you know, I was like, oh, I'm a poet. I came out the bathroom like, yes, I'm a poet. I got to give me some dreads. I had a perm the next week. I lost it because I thought the culture was one thing and I needed to draft myself into the culture in order to be what I was, and I didn't need to do that. I didn't need to change who I was at all. I was good enough, but I didn't realize that. So I kept trying to be what everybody else was. And I looked in the mirror one day and I could not stand my own reflection. And that's a horrible piece of the puzzle to miss, your own identity. So what I had to do was gather that village, those mentors, those people that I talked about a little bit earlier, those people that was looking at me like, who are you trying to be? Why are you trying to be it? And then they didn't, that was, was not rhetorical questions. Like, they really wanted answers. So I'm like, um, I don't know. You know, the horrible, the most horrible person you will ever meet is a gifted person with no accountability, with nobody can tell you nothing. You so gifted, can't nobody say nothing to you, can't nobody check you. That's the most horrible person you'll ever meet. We all need that village of mentors, those people that will keep us in line. I remember my friend, LaShawn, we sitting at the table, and she was like, Tamikia, you need to quit posting pictures, and you need to produce. And I was like, what? But she was right, because I would make an album, photocopy of it, post it on Facebook like I done produced the album, and be done with it, because it helped me. It ain't helped nobody else, though, because I ain't really did nothing else with it. So I had to realize we fall in love with the image of a thing. We see other people's relationships, and we don't trust that our relationship is good as theirs because their pictures look better than ours. And it's all false. It's not even real. So then that last piece for me became love. Now, if you know anything about poetry, you know that we all have a signature piece. So one day I was out, and I was doing this poem. And I was saying, who can start with L and in with the end, be the OV that sits in the middle of me. Who can start with the L and end with the end? Be the OV that sits in the middle of me. Who can start with the L and who can end with the end? Be the OV that sits in them, but you won't let nobody, but you won't let nobody. That's all I kept hearing in my head while I was doing a poem. Had nothing to do with the poem, but what was happening was I was asking a question and I kept hearing the answer in my head. The answer was always there. It was always people around me to love me, but I didn't love me. And because I didn't love me, I didn't love my own identity, and I wasn't walking in forgiveness, which is how those pieces came together. And I realized that matters of the heart were heart matters. And when it came to relationship, trust was very essential. So I had to learn how to trust. I had to learn how to forgive. I had to learn my identity, and I had to learn love. And trusting the process is not easy because somebody will always remind you of what you did, where you came from, your background, your lack of education, you're not pretty, and the statistics that's around supporting everything that they just said about you. But it don't matter. The reality of it is, I'm the author of my story, and every decision that I make determines what that chapter looks like. It's a paradox because the process of becoming has everything, yet it has nothing to do with me. It's about a generation that's still locked in their grandmother's bathrooms still contemplating suicide, still trying to give up, and still haven't found their voice yet. When it's all said and done, each and every last one of us in here is a piece to somebody's puzzle. And you're left with the responsibility of becoming.